So it was those a combination of those things. Looking on the outside, looking into the party, because you're out of politics now. Do you do you do you hedge your bets on and making an announcement of running, or did you know that if he announces he's going to step down, I will run? Was it a back and forth, like getting into provincial politics, or did you have to be convinced two or three times before you actually announced your campaign? Because from media reports, and I've gone back to 1985 when you announced, there was a lot of underwell, like oh, like uh, like an undertone that you were the man, the, the the heir apparent for Bill Bennett. Well, it didn't hurt that I was out of politics. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I was not. A politician that they were looking at that they didn't like or whatever. So I was out of politics, had been out of politics for a time, but the pressure was enormous. I said, no, I don't want to go there. I've been there. I, I want to be at home, stay with the family, do some regular stuff. And um, so, but the pressure was enormous. I was getting a lot of good friends, people in business, working people, regular folks coming to my place of business, my place and Lillian, she ran most of it and uh, trying to convince me that I should get involved and seek the leadership. And I kept saying, no, no, I, I pre finally, finally a, a friend of mine, um, an entrepreneur, his, his name was Peter Toygo. Peter Toygo ran the White Spot restaurants here, and uh, he was he was probably the most convincing of all. He came to me and said, "Look, we'll do everything for you. You don't. You can still continue on doing whatever you need to do for Lillian. We'll we'll manage things for you." And um, I didn't see too many others in the running that I was worried about defeating. So. Yeah, well, that's and that's and that's the weird part because that leadership race, it's not really a leadership race, it's a premiership race because the, the eventual winner will go on to become premier. And exactly. if you look at the list of people who ran, I think there was 11 people, if I'm not mistaken, or 10, 10 to 11 people who actually announced their intentions. And you win on the fourth ballot. You win on the fourth ballot. Did you expect to win on the fourth ballot? Or did you expect to potentially even go longer because like I said, a lot of people announced their candidacy and you win this. You kind of have to feel good about yourself that you've won on the fourth ballot, but at the same time, you're like, really fourth ballot. Could I not have won on the first? <laughs> the best part of the best part of my campaign was that I really didn't care if I won or lost. Wow. A politician really who speaks bother. his mind. I'm very impressed by that, Premier. <laughs> I said, you know what? If I lose, it's okay. I don't care. I don't really need or want this job. But I, I okay, I can be one of the options. And I wasn't afraid of somebody else winning. Naturally, mind you, when you finally get to the point where people start to cast ballots, you want to be a winner then. <laughs> So I, I won't I won't deny that. But during the whole of that campaign leading up to it, I was doing what needed to be done, doing it the best way I could. But if I lost, it wasn't going to bother me. Well, I, I, so I didn't count on a first or a second or a third ballot. I thought whatever comes, OK. You, 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 like we said, you are the winner of the race. You are the now premier elect of British Columbia. Yeah. A boy who does not, is not born in British Columbia, who emigrates to British Columbia with his family at a young age, is now in the highest office in that province. At that right. moment in time, what are you thinking to yourself? Because while you might not have wanted to win, you are now the winner. And you are now the premier of the province. Right. What's going through your head when you now have to bear the weight of every single British Columbian on your shoulders? Because what you decide affects their day-to-day -day life. So I like challenges, as I started to tell you initially. And uh, 
that to me was seen as another challenge. And fortunately, I had a wonderful wife and Lil in Lillian who supported me all the way in every way. I had the children supporting me. So the family was behind me and the people uh, that I've worked with in the business were all very supportive. Once I was selected to be the candidate people wanted for premier, I knew that I would uh, try to do the very best job I could. So yeah, I set in to do the job and well, you don't you don't start right away. You get sworn in, and then a month later, you go, "Let's go to an election, guys," because you know that's exactly what everyone wants at this moment. Three years into your term, newly elected premier, uh, I'm going to run for an election. Let's let's call an election. Let's issue the writs and let's get down to it. Um, you you said in the interview that you wanted a fresh start. You wanted a fresh start, a fresh mandate for yourself and sort of a renewal of the social credit party. Um, that election- it's pretty, pretty difficult to have a fresh start for a party that's been around for a yeah. long time. So yeah, there were, there were problems, no question about that. And, um, but also while I was involved, I, I, I realized that I, I, I might not want to run again that in some ways helped because I didn't have to consider everything in terms of politics, I could, which is what generally happens. Yeah. I was able to sit back and say, what, what's best to do? Even if they don't realize it immediately in the long term, what's the best thing that I can do? So it didn't hurt me. And, uh, but yeah, it, it was not easy. You're right. So you are now the premier. You run in the 1986 election. You are re-elected to a majority government. You are now tasked with appointing your first cabinet. Well, you still have a cabinet that you had to appoint beforehand. This is your. This is a new mandate, new cabinet. So you were on the other side of getting tapped on the shoulder. Now you are there tapping other people on the shoulder and say, I need you to do that. This role, this role, or this role. That's where I made my first mistake. <laughs> okay. Well, why do you say that? <laughs> because I thought, you know what, in order to keep peace among the people that I'll be working with, I should probably bring back most of the people that were already, that were already there when I took over from Bill Bennett. Maybe that'll bring peace because there was a lot of friction in the party and uh, between the, the members in the government when I took over, in part because of who I was, in part because of what I said, in part because they knew how I might approach things. So there was a lot of friction. So I thought if I can keep these people there and work with them, maybe they'll become very supportive, work with me and we'll do it all together. I'll be okay by that. And then over time, I can bring in new people. What's a mistake? I should have changed a lot of people because some of the people that I had run against for the leadership at the leadership convention were in that cabinet. Not just some, actually quite a few. I was going to say almost all, but I think one. Almost different. all of them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were, they were, they were uh, a burden. And the trouble is, if I had changed that initially, if I had changed that initially, there might have been some outfall from that. There would have been. But when you change it further down the road, it's difficult, if not impossible. They become nasty. Now, I'm, I'm just going to break in here for a second. I just want to ask this question before we continue on. We, we are almost coming up to an hour. Do you have another 20 minutes? Because this conversation is enlightening and I, I, I still haven't even gotten to today's politics. Is that okay or do you need to go? Yeah, we'll, we'll probably need a lot more than 20 minutes if you want to go through it all. But we'll let's, settle let, let's, let's do it. If it's a two hour episode, then I'll split it into <laughs> two episodes. Um, so you have a new cabinet, you have a new mandate. You are now the premier of the province. 
you are dealing in 1986 for those who are who can remember back to then you have a conservative pre- prime minister in ottawa brian mulrooney you have conservative conservatism on the rise across the uh prairies and potentially not saskatchewan i don't remember my math here correctly but conservative is conservatism is on the rise how was it as a social credit premier to deal with the likes of, uh, well, I, I think it was Frank Miller in Ontario. You had Renny Levesque. You had you had uh, Peter Lougheed, Don Getty in Alberta, Brian Mulroney in Ottawa. What was it like to sit around the table with some of those people and try to advocate? Because they are strong-headed names. And people like Bill Davis and even Don Getty, they take a lot of oxygen up in the room from time to time. You know, it wasn't it wasn't difficult okay. uh, because when you're dealing with other premiers, as I did then yeah. and, I, and did a number of times on various issues, uh, the politics you could hardly tell the new Democrat from the conservative. I think people do things differently when they're in a group like that. The politics as we've seen them or as we might see them at the provincial level when you're dealing politically on issues because people have different views, they don't occur at these gatherings. I found it very refreshing, very refreshing. What would you say was the biggest issue that your fellow premiers and yourself had to deal with after you were elected? Because We'll talk about national issues here during your time in office, but then we'll also talk about some provincial issues. What was the biggest issue for you? Was it that start of that free trade agreement talk? Exactly. With Brian Mulroney? The nail on the head. Yeah, free trade was the issue. And free trade, uh, I think, was generally supported by pretty well everyone. They might have sought some changes, as I did. But there was a lot, generally, there was the principle was basically agreed to. So it was it was a big issue, took a lot of time, but it wasn't an extremely difficult issue. What was the biggest concern that you had with it? What was my biggest concern? Yeah, because you talked about while we, while we were in agreement with the issue of free trade, there were some things that may uh, might want it differently. So what was some of those issues that you said, was it lumber issues? Was it LNG? Was it natural gas? What were some of the issues that you were advocating for that may have fallen on deaf ears in Ottawa? No, again, you're right. Uh, the lumber issue, for example, was important for us because mm-hmm. that was much of our economy. Uh, the, uh, the issue of perhaps uh, being gov- not governed, but be being uh, being influenced by people from the U.S. or uh, or Mexico about the natural resources issue. Could we could we continue to mine? Mining was also a big issue. Yeah, those were issues we had to address and talk about and be concerned about. Did you have a good working relationship with Mulroney? Yeah, very good. Yeah, he was a pretty smooth guy. (laughs) He was pretty smooth. So, yeah, he was, uh, he did a good job in for what he had to do i didn't agree with everything he did i don't agree with everything he stands for or wants to see done today, but I, I think he was a pretty smooth guy and try to uh, satisfy the people as best he could. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Getting back to some provincial issues, what was the biggest issue that you dealt with during your premiership? 
Uh, I should know that one, shouldn't I? The biggest issue I dealt with during or what, what, what do you think was the biggest issue that didn't get a lot of media attention? Because you, you people can always see the outside of politics. Oh, right now it's LNG. We need to get oil resources to market. We need to build pipelines. But if you're sitting in the premier's chair, that is going to be completely different because you are seeing every file. You are seeing every single thing come across your desk because at the end of the day, you have to go out and sell it to the people of British Columbia. So what was the issue that you said, I, I, I'm, we need to tackle this, even though it's not getting any airtime, media play, the papers aren't covering it, the radio stations aren't covering it. What was that issue for you? I think the big issue at the time that sort of went away but came back a number of times, so it was with us, perhaps for the whole of the time that I was there, was education. Was it about the shrinking of the uh, bureaucracy around education? The bureaucracy generally was a problem because bureaucracies tend to grow and they <laughs> did yeah. even during my time. But um, I think the educational issue was never really addressed as well as it might have been. And I have to take some responsibility for that as well. Now, again, constituents man versus being a per, uh, premier of a province is a challenging task because you are not a constituents man of one. You are a constituents man of every single riding in the province of British Columbia. Exactly. You are, you are a self-described pe uh, people person. You enjoy getting out and meeting people. Sitting in Victoria must be boring when you're a people person, when you want to get out and actually connect with the people. Was that the best part of the Premier's job, was connecting on that level and hearing the stories from people up in Chilliwack, people down in Hope, people down in Kelowna? Was it interesting to hear and being able to affect their lives when you hear their stories as a Premier compared to a Cabinet Minister? So if uh, Lillian never criticizes me much, if at <laughs> all, and that's just as well. But, you know, um, if, the, if there's one criticism she might have had is that I was traveling too much. <laughs> I, was, I was not spending, and others were saying, you're not spending enough time in Victoria. I wanted to be in Fort St. John. I wanted to be in Dawson Creek. I wanted to be in Williams Lake and Quinnell and... Kelowna, all of those places, because uh, truthfully, the people in greater Vancouver get lots of attention. The people in the outlying districts oftentimes don't get that much attention. So I was probably the most traveled premier of all times. Even I until went... today, I would say, because I do not see John Horgan up in Fort St. John, or even Christy Clark up in, or when she was premier up in Fort St. John. She might correct me on that, but you traveled a lot. <laughs> I traveled a lot. Uh, now, in fairness, whomever is there during the pandemic times, as we've seen it for the last two, three years, probably is wise to kind of stay away from it. That whole pandemic thing, the whole COVID thing is one that um, probably discourages people from traveling, not only because they have to wear a mask and have, have to keep a distance, but also because there's uh, some real mixed views on this whole COVID thing, as you know. Yes. And if you want, we can talk about that in a few minutes. But I want to talk... And I, I did not prepare you for this question, so I do apologize. And I think you're, you've been op open and upfront. And if I ask the question inappropriately, I will take it out, but I think you're up for it. I wanna talk about the downfall of Premier Bill Vanderzon. You had a fall from grace where you bought a, a park and, and I'm not trying to be rude and I do not wanna do the gotcha questions, but I want to talk uh, through talk talk me through what was going on during that time. You were acquitted. You there was no wrongdoing at all, according to the Supreme Court of British Columbia. But I want to talk about that moment. Can you just take me through what was going on during that time? So that probably was my second biggest mistake, maybe the biggest mistake of all, 
in that when I was accused of a conflict of interest with respect to the sale of the fantasy gardens in Richmond, mm -hmm. uh, when I was accused of that, I said, investigate all you want. And well, who would you have investigate? I, I don't care who investigates. I don't care. You can pick the attorney general or his deputy. I don't care. And what will you do if that happens? Whatever their findings, if they think there's a, even if they think there's a conflict of interest, I'll quit. Because I see no wrongdoing. I did nothing wrong. And I'll, but I was a, a little bit uh, naive in taking that approach to it. Because the moment I picked the deputy attorney general and the, and the attorney general had been seeking the position that I had, was quite upset. As a matter of fact, people tell me now that he openly said to their group, how did they pick a deep, a deep ear? How did, they pick, how did they pick an immigrant or foreigner? It can't be. So he was upset in more ways than one. And um, do you regret saying what you said at that time to say, if there's any wrongdoing, I will step down because you seem it was like the a wrong thing to do. You, you seem like a very principled man. And I think you, you, you say what you say is what you believe and what you will do. Yeah. And you don't find that many politicians like that right now, but to, to say that as a sitting first minister, the premier of a province, and then do it. That took guts. Keep in mind that at the time, when I started out as the premier, the media, the mainstream media, we didn't have you and people like you. It was a different scenario. There was no computer or little of it. So when uh, the mainstream media was very supportive when, when I started out, they did they said nice things. They said accurate things. It was all good. But that turned very quickly. It didn't last. And for that particular issue, they saw an opportunity to really tackle me and to do whatever it took to put me down and to embarrass me or have me quit. So I was being hammered unbelievably. Not only me, but the business and Lillian. It was all being hammered. The kids, the children, they were all great, but they were all being, everyone was being hammered. So you say things and do things during a time like that, which you might not have said if you had had the time to think it through reasonably. No, it was a mistake on my part. I should not have done it, but I did. And having done it, ah, yeah, I kind of regret it, but... Um, no it, regrets in life at the end of the day, that's right? It. But I, I, I got to ask the, the 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 question that everyone will be screaming at their car radio or listening to this on YouTube, and that is, do you think you could have won that next election? Do you think you could have won the 1991 election? Because the NDP have a new leader with Mike Hall, 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 Hall Court, Court, sorry, Court. Uh, former mayor of Vancouver. Do you think you would have had a better chance of winning against him? Or do you think because of the longevity of the uh, the time in office of the social credit, the rise of the NDP in Ontario in 1990, that it was just time that the social credit, like you said, they get interchanged out? Yeah, and it's a good thing we're not in part at the power today because the name social credit now is associated more with China. <laughs> So it's a whole other scenario. Well, it's like the People's but, Party of Canada, right? <laughs> a lot of people yeah. go, why'd you name it People's Party of Canada when there's a People's Party of China? Really, Maxine? Really? <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually sent an email to the leader of the People's Party saying, you know what, I agree with much of what you're saying, but maybe you might look at the name again. Call it Canada first instead of the People's Party. Because people, just as you said, Tend to, tend to associate that with China and communism. Anyway, uh, no, I, I definitely made a mistake when I uh, turned it over to the deputy attorney general. And um, I had some regrets, but 
it happened. And uh, did you enjoy your time as premier, though, as much as we talk about the the bads and the people who might have attacked you in, internally? Did you enjoy it? Because few people, 20 some odd people have only have 30 some odd people have only ever had that position. You are one of them. Did you enjoy yeah. it? And you know what? In answer to your question, I think we could have been reelected. I think we could have been reelected. And um, um, I was not a bad campaigner. I was a fairly good campaigner. And I think I could have guided the party during an election. We could have done quite well. Vandermania. <laughs> I had made a commitment. So I said, that's it. I'm staying with it. So life after politics. How is it as a former premier to be on the outside during the 90s? Because in the 90s, you, you see a complete change in government across the nation, except Alberta, because Alberta is one of those weird provinces where we like our provincial parties and we like to just kick out the leader from time to time. But um, you see John Cretchen elected as liberal prime minister. You see the rise of the NDP in British Columbia. You see the NDP in Ontario. As a outsider looking in now, do you just turn politics off and go about your day or do you still stay involved? I watch politics. I'm extremely concerned about what I see happening in politics today. I've never in all my years seen anything such as we have it now. So I'm concerned. I, I still get a lot of good comments from people. People, I've never ever had to face a protest after having quit politics. I've never had to face a, a protest and I've never had to uh, receive, I never received a whole lot of nasty criticism. People are friendly and oftentimes very complimentary. And that feels good, There's no doubt about that. Uh, but the politics today, I don't know. Anyway, we can get into that separately. That's a whole other hour and a half. <laughs> Which I want, I want to talk about the state of politics today because as a member, as the former premier of the Social Credit Party, former leader of the Social Credit Party, former premier of uh, British Columbia, you must look at the crop of politicians today and just shake your head because you were in the era of people like Bill Bennett, yourself, Brian Mulrooney, Don Getty, Ralph Klein a little bit. I know a little bit overlap there, but you must look at politicians today and just shake your head about how they perform and how they act compared to the traditional politician that you were and you were around in the 80s much of uh, what i might have to criticize about has really happened in the last few years particularly i think it's become much more evident in the last few years than what i saw it in previous years so do you mean by like like when justin trudeau got elected like 2015 era or even later, like even the last few years, like two, three years since the rise of the pandemic? I think the last, the last three, four, five years have been the most telling for me. And I, again, a lot of people won't necessarily agree with what I see or view, but um, yeah, I think politics right now is as confusing and as bad as, a, as I've ever seen this. Do you think we are more divided country than we have ever been terribly divided and it's not only the country it's at the local level it's within families it's with friends this COVID thing is unbelievably uh dividing the country and the people and the families and it's affecting everybody so how do we unify as someone who has brought uh, province together who's voted for you how do we bring a country together because I have railed on this issue numerous times on this show that the rise of social media the rise of the the uh, negativity that we see on a daily basis on the media it is dividing us how do we stop it 
and heal our problem or heal our country? First of all, I don't think this COVID thing is going to go away during my lifetime and much beyond. I think it's here for a long time. We're now on the fourth booster shots, booster shot, and that's only just begun. Number one. Secondly, the worst thing about the whole COVID thing is that we've not been leveled with. Had Fauci and the likes of them in Canada, the US and elsewhere in the world leveled with us a little bit more, a lot more than what they did, uh, we wouldn't be having the problems that we see today and that are yet to come. Uh, so I think it's uh, the old story again, if people were told the truth from the outset without somebody having a negative agenda, um, it would have been different and it would be different. Do you think so our how do you go back and do that? I don't know how you do, how you go back and do that. The problem now is that the pharmaceutical industry is spending billion, is making billions and they're happy to continue on and they're a big power. The billionaires that are in the camp of the Klaus Schwab economic conference, they like it because the worst thing that could happen Nothing, nothing is going to happen to them that's going to hurt too much. They, uh, if anything, they won't have to put up with strikes and, and, and protest because if in fact we end up because of this, which is my prediction, with a globalization, uh, it'll have to be, and it's going to be a, a sort of a one world order government, it'll have to be communist. If you're going to rule the world, it's got to be by dictate, by power, by forcing people. Otherwise, it won't work. So we've got trouble ahead, big time, big time trouble ahead. And when this particular pandemic doesn't work anymore and they've got to go to something else, there will be another pandemic. It's scary. What I see happening in the world today is bad, bad. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. When, when you, we talked about the Freedom Convoy that started in BC and went to Ottawa, um, when you see people engaged like that, who actually stand up while you may disagree with them or agree with them, agree with their methods, agree with exactly everything they say, we can debate that for another hour and a half. But when you see people actually stand up and say, you know what, we're just not going to take it anymore. We, we want to be talked to like adults in the room. We don't want to be talked to like children. And some of the people who were there were children, let's be honest. There were some people who said some weird things there that I just do not disagree with at all. But do you think politicians have a duty to our, the general public to talk to us like adults and not talk to us like we're immature children? So what I'm worried about too, and this will ties, ties in with your question. What I'm worried about too is that the politicians don't have that much power. We tend to give them a lot more credit for what's done than what they deserve. The bureaucracy is far more powerful because they continue on long after the politicians are gone. The big influences, the big powers, the people like Soros and, and, and uh, Bill Gates and uh, Klaus Schwab, they have far more an influence on the politicians and what the politicians or the governments do than my neighbor across the street. It's, um, that's the scary part. It's, it's, we're being governed almost by these outside influences. They're the power. I'm disappointed in the politicians because few of them speak out. Well, speak up. I, 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 I'm so happy you're on the show because you talked earlier on in the episode of 
there was the, the light between the different parties, the NDP, the liberals and the conservatives. And you don't see much of a difference to them. You might see a policy here or there, but at the end of the day, they're kind of all the same. And I think the majority of people will kind of agree with that statement. Some might disagree with some of the smaller parties, but the major three are kind of the same. I'm not sure if you've been following politics or national politics a little bit closer uh, lately, especially with the conservative leadership race. We have a candidate, Pierre Polyver, who is running on a message of freedom. Freedom from the gatekeepers, freedom from this, freedom from that. Do the conservatives, and I, I, I say that lightly because I know you say you identify with the People's Party a little bit closer than the conservatives, but do the conservatives need to take a 180 turn and start putting distance between them and the liberals to potentially win the next election? I think if Maxine and the People's Party could somehow keep to their promises and, and their suggestions or proposals of what needs to be done, they would stand a pretty good chance. The problem too often is that people get elected to politics and all the promises are, well, they're, they're different. They, I, I don't remember any promises any politician ever tells me because by the time they get elected, they yeah, are, oh, what promise? I didn't say that. What are you talking about? I'm assuming you're different, but I've been around the block a few times. Although so if no. you look across the border, I don't agree with what I see happening in the USA. But if you look across the border, you can clearly distinguish between the Republicans and the Democrats. No doubt about it. Yeah. You can agree with either or disagree but at least they are totally different. Here, if you're a conservative in Alberta, you may not be a conservative federally. You might be a people's party. If you're a conservative in Ontario, you might be a federal liberal in BC. Let's be honest, the liberal party in BC might be conservative federally. BC is a weird entity on itself when it comes to identifying politics. You've got it. <laughs> um, I want to talk about one last subject before I let you go, Premier, and okay. that is the future. What's so, next? Yeah. The future. Yeah. What's next for you? you? You've written two books. You are retired. Is it just relaxing now? What do you, what does, what's an average night for the former Premier of British Columbia look like? So a lot of people tell me, Bill, when are you going to retire? <laughs> and I say, you know what? I, I keep busy. I'm not as involved in politics <clears throat> as I used to be, for sure. But I still go out in the garden and do all my stuff. I keep very busy. I still have work in the office. I'm still doing a land development, at least trying to get it done in merit. It's shaping up very nicely. And there's a tremendous demand for housing, even in merit right now. Oh, wow. So it's happening everywhere. So it's a good thing to be involved with. <laughs> uh, however, um, yeah, I, I guess the time will need to come that I can actually sit down and watch a TV program or watch a movie or go to a movie. When will it come? I'm not making, when I, when I first met Lillian, I said, Lillian, when I'm 55, I'm going to retire. One promise I didn't keep. I kept going. So she does. She says you'll keep. You'll never quit. So she's probably right. But I will slow down, and I enjoy life enormously. I I go shopping with Lily, and I do things. So I'm enjoying normal life much more than I ever did. Looking back on your career in politics. From that moment in 19, I want to get this right, 1965, when you were first elected as an alderman for the city of Surrey. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy your life in politics? I know you said, why did I do it? But did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. And you're, I find now, a phenomenal interviewer. But I wouldn't be on your program if I didn't 
hadn't enjoyed it and didn't enjoy it so much now. I still watch it. I still enjoy it. I still want to get involved, but I realize I shouldn't get too anxious about that. Well, I, oh my God, I forgot to ask. I, I forgot the million dollar question because I was in Ontario during the time that we had our HST debacle. You in British Columbia were the kind of the spearhead of taking the HST down. Let's, if you have time, let's talk about that before I wrap up here, because I can't believe I missed that because you did get back into politics later on in 2011, 2012. Why was it so important to you to get the HST overturned? So for those who don't know, I apologize. For those who don't know, HST is the harmonized sales tax, which the premier, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, premier, but premier Christy Clark introduced the harmonized sales or Gordon Campbell introduced Gordon it. Gordon Campbell. Gordon Campbell introduced it. And what it is, is the provinces, the federal government said to the provinces, hey, what we're going to do is we will administer the tax system if you combine them. So we'll take the provincial sales tax and the govern the federal sales tax, put them together, and it will be done. Why was that so important for you to get that overturned? Because they did introduce it. It did pass. They got their rebates, but you said, no, I don't like it. So when you say put them together, yep. you miss saying that when they say that, they don't tell you <laughs> that putting them together means you, you'll be taxed on a host of other things that you weren't previously taxed on. I wanted you to say that, Premier, not Labor, <laughs> la labor included. I mean, it's just the HST, the GST now goes on everything in BC. The provincial sales tax makes exemptions. So I saw it as an increase, an, an increased attempt to raise the taxes on the people of the province. Everybody said, and, and they were presenting it as, it'll simplify things, taxes won't go up, we'll make up for it someplace else by diminishing or reducing or eliminating never happens. It never happens in politics or in government anyway. But um, everybody said, Bill, you're crazy to take this on. What a massive job. You have to get 10% of all the people that vote in every constituency. No matter how many people you get, if it isn't 10% in one constituency, you've lost it. You can't do it. Great try, but the legislation was so designed to make it difficult. And this is an impossibility. Well, we won. We had a group of people that met in my office here, my outside office regularly. And we devised a means that worked extremely well. We traveled, I traveled the province. I went to every constituency spoke out against the HST, and it worked wonderfully well. What a celebration we had when, in fact, we defeated the HST and stopped the government from adding further taxes. We're being taxed to death. Mind you, they're doing it now differently. I, I, tax. I, bought, I bought some milk yesterday. It's um, lactose-free, good milk, and there's a tax on the carton. I can't return it for a refund, but there's a tax on the carton now. So they're taxing now these, these new uh, environmental taxes, which are e more easily defended, are coming on to practically everything you, you buy or eat. I, I'm so sorry I missed that, but I'm so glad that you were able to talk about that for a little bit. Um, we'll do it again. Premier, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I, I've been going through some health issues and this interview has just cheered me up so immensely because A, I got to chat with someone I respect. B, you are the first uh, former premier I've had on the show. Uh, thank you so much. Like, I, I can't say enough. Like, I just don't know how to say thank you enough with this. Well, you're a great interviewer and I really appreciate being on with you and we may do it again. In the meantime, however, to you, to your family, to everybody, to all the people that are listening or viewing the program. Have a blessed and happy Easter. All the best.
God bless. So with that, I want to thank the former premier for coming in and sitting down with us tonight. Um, but also uh, to my listeners, to my viewers, and to everyone who is going to listen to this and watch it later on, um, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, go have a conversation with somebody. Get out from behind the cell phone, get out from behind social media, and go have a conversation with somebody. It does actually make a difference in our world when we can actually have a face-to-face -face conversation may not be with the former premier of British Columbia. It may be with your neighbor. And sometimes that's all that matters. Conversations do matter. And I want to thank the former premier. And I want to thank everyone who's been on the show for doing this because it's been an honor and a pleasure. So with that, I'm Chris Brown, the host of the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone, keep talking. <laughs>